Okay, we'll go ahead and get started then. Depending on where you are in the world, this greeting may not apply, um, but a good morning. Um, it is 8 a.m. in Southern New Jersey, um, but that also might mean, depending on where you are, good afternoon or good evening. Um, at any rate, welcome to the first keynote of our All Black Lives Matter, Black Germany and Beyond Conference. My name is Dr. Keith Green. I'm the Director of Africana Studies here at Rutgers University in Camden, which is hosting this year's conference. This is the fifth international conference of the Black, German, and Heritage Research Association and the 10th anniversary of that organization. What an incredible mind milestone. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our first keynote speaker for the conference, Dr. Michael McKeetrain. Dr. Michael McKeetrain is a visiting researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights. He has a PhD in philosophy with distinction from Abo Academy University in Finland and has held positions at universities in the US, Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, Sweden, Germany, and the UK. His current research focus is on post-colonial, decolonial perspectives on human rights, structural, racial discrimination, and reparatory justice. He has several publications of special note, Afro-Nordic Landscapes, Equality and Race in Northern Europe. Dr. McKeetrain is a regular commentator on issues of race for international as well as Swedish media. He is also a seasoned universal human rights advocate who, among other things, has helped found several CSOs and served as an expert advisor to the UN around the international decade for people of African descent from 2015 up through 2024. We are honored to have Dr. McKeetrain kick off our conference, and we look forward to the day when we might physically host you on our campus. But for now, Dr. McKeetrain, the virtual floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Keith, for, for, for that very kind introduction. And my warmest thanks also to Rosemary Pena for, for kindly inviting me to give this keynote. I think it's an impressive and multifaceted conference program. So congratulations to you and, and your co-organizers. The title of my talk is African Diasporas in Europe Beyond Culture and Identity. I hope that it is a title that will make you ask what on earth are African diasporas if not a matter of culture and identity. Let's wait and see. So this is a talk about black studies and what it means to be black in Europe. It is a talk that places Germany in a broader African diasporic and European contexts. So most of what I say here should be understood as applicable to Germany as well as Europe in general. However, let me begin by saying a few words about the corner of Europe that more than any other part of Europe has inspired the reflections of this talk, namely Sweden. Among the broad socio-political conditions of being black in Europe is the pervasive racial stratification across Europe, which most often places people of African descent and Roma at the bottom of the social order, coupled with both a widespread and state-sanctioned rejection that race is socially, culturally, politically, or legally relevant, Europe's colorblindness, as some would say, although we probably should avoid this ableist term, as well as a widespread state-sanctioned denial that half a millennia of European colonialism and imperialism has shaped and continue to shape our world along racial lines within as well as among countries, and that European countries bear some responsibility for this. That is to say, colonial amnesia, as some have termed it. When it comes to socially pervasive racial stratification, coupled with a denial of race and the continuing impact of colonial history, 
Sweden is a European country on steroids. For example, if we look at the cross-country comparisons in the European Union Minorities and Discrimination Survey, Sweden is among the top half of the countries in the EU that are the most discriminating against people of African descent. The domestic studies that have been done in such areas as employment, housing, education, healthcare, and law enforcement show that Sweden is a racially stratified and segregated country where, for instance, people of African descent are overrepresented among the unemployed in menial labor and where those of us with university degrees are unlikely to find jobs that match our level of education. Our children have alarmingly high elementary school dropout rates, and most of us live in racially segregated public housing or former public housing communities of high-rise tenement blocks. In Sweden, as in France, colloquially called suburbs. Of course, this is not the sort of image that the Swedish state sells to the world. Circa 60 to 80 years of what we may call Swedish nation branding has effectively projected Sweden as a white European nation that is progressively egalitarian, open, and tolerant with a high, uh, with a solid uh, welfare state that ensures equal opportunities and rights for all, irrespective of background, a stalwart champion for human rights, gender equality, the rights of refugees, international development, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-apartheid, and more. Especially those of you who are familiar with the international role of Sweden during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, up until around the time of Prime Minister Ulof Palme's murder, will be very familiar with this image. It is an image that places Sweden outside European histories of colonialism and imperialism and fervently denies that race as a social category and racial discrimination as a social phenomena is relevant to mainstream society. And moreover, posits Sweden are so progressively post-racial that it has excluded the terms racial discrimination and race from its anti-discrimination law and replaced them with the euphemisms, ethnic discrimination, ethnic and national origin, and skin color. You will not find any acknowledgement from any of the political parties in power, such as the Social Democrats, nor in mainstream media, except for some occasional opinion articles by myself and others, that say skin color discrimination or skin color segregation is a pervasive social problem in Sweden. Instead, you will these days find much heated political debate about which political party can be the toughest on the increase of gang related violence coming out of these racially segregated communities. Gang related violence in which I'm sorry to say African descendant youth are overrepresented. Of course, similar trends of racial stratification and systemic anti-Black racism may be found in Germany and other European countries, including the UK. This is confirmed, for instance, by the reports on European countries during the past 10 years by the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, including the one on Germany in 2017. On the other hand, and here we come to the crux of the matter that I would like to discuss with you today, and which presents a challenge to Black European studies, the demographics and history of people of African descent in Sweden are such that we cannot speak of any, speak of any widely self-identified Black community here, be it in a racial, ethnic, or cultural sense. In this, Sweden is not much different from most, if not all, other European countries. At least at least 2% of Sweden's population of approximately 10 million residents are Black, 
the great majority of us are either born in or have one or two parents who are born in the Horn of Africa. For example, Somalia, Eritrea, or Ethiopia. The rest of us are mostly first or second generation Swedish residents with a background in other African countries, such as Gambia, Nigeria, or Kenya, whereas a minority of us, probably no more than 5%, have, like myself, backgrounds in other parts of the African diaspora, such as the Caribbean, Latin America, and the US. In other words, much like most other European countries, including Germany, and except perhaps for the UK and Netherlands, the great majority of black people in Sweden belong to so-called new African diasporas with a background in colonial or for the most part post-colonial Africa. This is to be contrasted with so-called old African diasporas in such regions as the Caribbean, Latin America, the US, in the Middle East, and around the Indian Ocean, most of whom are the result of histories of trafficking and enslavement of Africans and people of African descent. Generally speaking, what is critical to understanding African diasporas and Black community building in Europe is the disparate and relatively novel nature of Black European collectives that they typically are without a joint cultural identity, nor even a recognized collective history in or in relation to their European countries. And the fact that the majority of Black African diasporas in Europe are new African diasporas with a recent background in Africa with its great multitude of ethnic groups, national, cultural, and religious identities, and where race and being quote unquote black often is not foregrounded. Again, to use Sweden or to use black Swedes as an illustration, Contrary to say Afro-Mexicans or people of African descent in La Reunion in the Indian Ocean, Black Swedes do not have a joint history, at least not an ancestral one of enslavement and or colonialism. Contrary to say Afro-Brazilians relationship with Brazil and Portugal or even the relationships of many African descendants in France, Belgium, Netherlands or the UK to these countries, Black Swedes do not have any collective historical relationship to Sweden. And arguably, most importantly, for what we are discussing here, contrary to say African Americans, Afro Trinidad and Tobagonians, not to mention say the Oromo people of Ethiopia and the Igbo of Nigeria and Cameroon, Black Swedes do not share a joint ethnic identity, culture, or tradition. Add to this that Sweden and most other European countries, including Germany, officially espouse at least the Eure equality and reject, reject the social, cultural, political, and legal relevance of race and colonial history. Nevertheless, while being de facto but often unofficially or implicitly socially premised on white European nationhood and white supremacy. When taken together, these social, cultural, political, and indeed racial conditions of being Black in Europe may make speaking of Black European communities seem elusive. With such points in mind, how then should we conceptualize African diasporas in, in Europe? Including the forms of black community building and mobilizing that in fact does take place across Europe. I set out to answer such questions in an article that was published last year uh, on conceptualizing African diasporas in Europe, which you can find online in the journal African Diaspora and a book chapter the year before that Pan-Africanism and the African Diaspora in Europe, which you can find in the book, The Rutledge Handbook of Pan-Africanism, edited by Rayland Rabaka. 
when situating African diasporas and indeed African diaspora studies in Europe, it may be helpful to distinguish between continental, cultural, and racial conceptualizations of African diasporas in Europe. I will not belabor these conceptual distinctions here. Let me just say that there already are plenty of scholarly work that refers to continental, cultural, and racial senses of African diasporas in Europe, and that especially regarding Europe, we cannot make any assumptions that African diasporas in a racial sense will overlap with culture or any other joint identity. However, since its beginnings in the 1960s and 70s, African diaspora studies has mostly been premised on a racial conceptualization of diaspora and focused on black African diasporas while usually understanding these in terms of racial and cultural identities and communities. Although old African diasporas across the Americas, which were created out of the middle passage, developed overlapping racial and cultural identities and may often be described as ethnic groups with joint cultural and racial identities. In contemporary Europe, the situation is, as I have described it, more complicated. Still, in the history of transplanting African diaspora studies from the US to Europe, we oftentimes find similar conceptualizations of the African diaspora in terms of race, culture, and identity. This is true of what I have characterized as the first wave of African diaspora studies on Europe with the likes of Paul Gilroy, Stuart Hall, and Jacqueline Nassi Brown during the 1980s, 90s, and noughts or noughties. Although these scholars view African diasporas in Europe as premised on social political conditions and processes, they still end up conceptualizing African diasporas in Europe in terms of racial and cultural identities. At least for Gilroy and Hall, this is in part due to their cultural studies view of culture as imbued with politics and politics as imbued with culture, especially when viewed against the background of racial identity politics, ethnic nationalism, nationhood, and the modern nation state as a political community. They both elaborate on the African diaspora in ways that puts the cultural, ethnic, racial, and political boundaries of the modern nation state into question, as well as similarly perceived boundaries of African diasporas. Both Hall and Gilroy are principally, as well as metaphysically, uh, opposed to essentializing racial and cultural identifications, both as they are part of the formation of European nation states, nationalisms, and white European identifications, and as they may arise too in black cultural expressions, representations, and identities. To both Gilroy and Hall, the nature of African diasporas offers metaphysical as well as normative challenges and correctives to essentializing notions of race, race culture, and the nation. However, although both Gilroy and Hall contextualize uh, Black African diasporas in social, political, and, and ethical terms, they still end up conceptualizing them in terms of culture and identity. The limitations of them in doing so should come into view by examining how Hall's and Gilroy's conceptualizations have evolved from the vantage point of the Black African diaspora in the UK, in particular, as it arose from the post-World War II generations of Carib Caribbean migrants and their descendants. Both Hall and Gilroy take interest in how circulating cultural representations and expressions, not least those of popular culture, inform Black identity making in the UK. 
their emphasis is on overlapping racial and cultural identifications of the African diaspora, which mostly have grown out of the new world experiences of old African diasporas. So-called new African diasporas or post-colonial African migrants or the great diversity of mostly new, but also old African diasporas in Europe do not play any major role in their conceptualizations. Yet in expanding African diaspora studies to include all people of African descent across Europe, the cross-Atlantic African diasporic model that Gilroy has termed the Black Atlantic or even assumed common diasporic denominators of black ident identification and culture may not offer the most inclusive model. This brings us to what may be char characterized as the second wave of African diaspora studies from the Norths until today with the likes of Michelle Wright, Paul Teyambe Selesa, Gloria Wecker and Fatima El Tayeb. This second wave has questioned the centrality of the Middle Passage and the Black Atlantic to African diasporas in Europe, especially in considering the large presence of so-called new African diasporas with more recent backgrounds in Africa, and that Black African diasporas in Europe are the result of a variety of historical processes and do not share the same confluences of racial, ethnic, and cultural identities as may be found in the Americas. As already mentioned, a critical difference between old and new African diasporas is that especially first generation new African diasporas tend to have less prominent racial identifications and in general, no developed cultural or ethnic con communities based on race even if it may be a taken for granted background assumption, a strong one even, that other people of their ethnic or national background will look similar to themselves. And given the large presence of new African diasporas in Europe, the ethnic, cultural, and even racial diversity of African Europeans with diverse backgrounds and histories, as well as their recent presence in relatively large numbers in European countries, mean that we cannot assume to find self-identified national Black communities in Europe, and especially not in any cultural sense. Somalis from Somalia, Akan from Ghana, or Wolof from Senegal in Norway, Belgium, or Italy, though they may recognize com uh, commonalities among each other as being phenotypically Black and from Africa, are not likely to see themselves as part of the same Norwegian, Belgian, or Italian Black community, especially not the same Black cultural community. For second wave scholars, like Michelle Wright and Fatima El Tayeb, the pronounced heterogeneity of racial, ethnic, cultural, and national identities among Black people in Europe, as well as their divergence from the US norm of having a historical background in the Middle Passage, is seen as a lesson to be learned about Black homogeneity as a myth. Nevertheless, as Michelle Wright points out in countries like Germany, a sense of belonging to a black community is still being forged. But it is a sense of community that is simultaneously based on overlapping experiences, such as the refusal to understand Afro-Germans as Germans and their location as outsiders to the nation, while recognizing its diversity and itself as inherently diasporic, counter-nationalist, and constituted by an open-ended dialogic process of identity making. However, while what may be called a second wave of African diaspora studies on Europe has further emphasized the heterogeneous nature of African diasporas in Europe, Nonetheless, this wave too has remained wedded to an idea of diaspora as constituted
by identity and culture. Then what is the alternative? I believe there is one that already is being developed such that we may even speak of a third wave of African diaspora studies in, on Europe. First, in summary, when speaking of African diasporas, we need to be mindful whether it is in a continental, cultural, or racial sense. Given the tendency of African diaspora studies from a new world horizon to conflate racial and cultural senses of the term, we need to be especially meticulous in distinguishing between racial and cultural conceptualizations of African diasporas and not take for granted that Black African diasporas in Europe have anything in common in cultural terms and can be conceptualized in such terms. Second, in addition, we need to give up presumptions that Black African diasporas in Europe have any shared identities as Black, African, or African descendants. Although the term Black, or the, although the terms Black, African, and or African descendant may be used as I am using them here in a descriptive sense of African diasporas in Europe, such uses should not be premised on any shared racial, cultural, or continental identities or identifications to emphasize that it is primarily subjective self-identities that we have in mind here. A race-based understanding of African diasporas in Europe presupposes references to populations with similar physical appearances and continental origins. Arguably, the term black is the most precise term to single out a certain race-based segment of African diasporas. However, it is also a term that may be, and in fact is, contested as overly racializing homogenizing, reductive, and charged with negative connotations. Especially members of the first generation of new African diasporas in Europe may reject the term black as a foreign imposition with little or no meaning in Africa as a self-designating term and a racial or cultural identification. Third, though it may makes sense to continue making a racial sense of diaspora, the center of African diaspora studies on Europe, given the social salience of race compared to ethnicity or culture more broadly, in broad, broad strokes, it should be conceptualized in social political terms. It will make for, or this will make for a more cohesive and comprehensive conceptualization, frame of reference and common denominator of black African diasporas in Europe than the current commonplace conceptualizations in terms of identity and culture. Even where people of African descent in Europe do not share a joint identity or culture as black, Africans or people of African descent, they still share similar or overlapping social political conditions. For example, having physical features that take on similar social meanings of being racialized as black with all the connotations that this entails in Europe, including being excluded from marginalized or ambiguously included in European nationhood. Conceptualizing Black African diasporas in Europe in terms of social and political meanings and contexts will mean that what is at stake is not social identities or identifications per se, but rather social positions. Similarly, members of the diaspora need not have any culture or identity in common to enable us to speak of them in social political terms as collectives with shared histories, situations, interests, rights, and or fates. Such social political conceptualizations and analysis will be decidedly structural or systemic by pointing to ways in which societies in a broad sense are organized. 
Furthermore, they will implicitly or explicitly evaluate the context, situations, and positions of African diasporas in political and ethic ethical terms, such as equality, dignity, freedom, justice, and rights. Moreover, in contrast to conceptualizations in terms of identity and culture, social political conceptualizations will allow for a broader and more inclusive comparative framework for people of African descent across the diaspora. For instance, it may point to how Black people as Black share similar social political conditions or circumstances across countries and continents, and that their similar physical features and continental origins take on similar meanings and result in similar social political positions of subordination and disempowerment or how black people as black in the diaspora, as well as in Africa, due to similar histories of colonialism, imperialism, and transnational racial stratification, may live in similar social political, including social economic formations or systems with international as well as national dimensions. It should be noted that such a social political conceptualization of black African diasporas in Europe does not exclude racial or cultural identities or identifications. For example, it may include considerations of how young African Europeans form black identifications and communities of belonging, even if only among like-minded friends or even imagine communities with other black folk across borders. Identifications say, based on a mixture of their social positionalities in society and recognition of similar positions of black folk elsewhere, a sense of being African, maybe from the vantage point of a specific African ethnicity and nationality, stylized senses of being Black borrowed from popular culture, such as hip hop and Afrobeat, and with a general sense of connection or affinity with Black cultural expressions around the world, and perhaps most critically, identification with Black freedom struggles. However, idiosyncratic to, uh, however idiosyncratic uh, to individuals or groups that such black identifications may be in any given European context to a social political conceptualization of Afri black African diasporas, such identifications may be relevant to, for instance, understanding how a sense of belonging to a black community may arise in practice and was what this means in a wider social and political context. Nonetheless, it will not treat such identifications as common denominators necessary or defining conditions for Black African diasporas in Europe. Such social political conceptualization uh, conceptualizations uh, characterizes what I call the third wave of African diaspora studies on Europe, also beginning in the north up until the present, and let's hope, or so I hope, uh, far into the future. Although such social political conceptualizations of Black African diasporas, diasporas in Europe are rare, and not articulated as such, uh, to this third wave, I would count, for instance, the African diaspora studies of Ol Olivette Otele with her lovely 2020 book, African European and Untold History, Elizabeth Mundimbe Boyi, Vanessa Eileen Thompson, Kwame Nimako, and uh, Stephen Small, including Stephen Small's 2017 doorstopper, 20 questions and answers on Black Europe. For instance, Elizabeth uh, Mundimbe Boyi speaks of a frequently self-designated Black France, which is multinational, multicultural, transcontinental, even multicolor, 
and does not represent a homogenous block, but instead an assemblage of micro societies. Still, despite their diversity, they find themselves similarly positioned in this global orbit with respect to their origins, France, colonization, political domination, cultural assimilation, and even social marginalization and invisibility. Similarly, Vanessa Eileen Thompson, Thompson describes a contemporary form of Black French collect collective solidarity exemplified by the grassroots activist group uh, Brigade uh, anti negrophobie uh, in the outskirts of Paris, which seeks to escape both the pitfalls of identity politics and France's official uh, abstract, uh, quote unquote, race free universalism by recognizing and embracing the multiplicities of Black experiences and identifications without subsuming them on the collective Black identity while taking seriously lived experiences of anti-Blackness and simultaneously providing a basis for interracial solidarity based on notions of urban conviviality and collective action. Such social political black European collectivism may be seen as a form of what Lewis Gordon in his most recent book that was published a few weeks ago, Fear of Black Consciousness, described as inherently political and uh, in his aspirations liberatory, uh, quote, black consciousness, which is, quote, organically linked to what black and all people ultimately need, the transformation of the society that produces anti-black racism and other kinds of dehumanization into something better, end quote. Such social political black collectivism may also be described as a form of what we may term pragmatic Pan-Africanism in line with the practical philosophy of common struggle of the canonical Pan-African conferences in London, Paris, Brussels, Lisbon, and Manchester, 1900, 1919, 1921, 1923, and 1945. The untold European history of these conferences may even serve as a philosophical framework for African diasporas in Europe. If we study their activities, organization, programs, speeches, manifestos, policy demands, and outcome documents, they represent a form of collectivism that sets aside caricatures of Pan-Africanism as wedded to racial and cultural essentialism and a joint Black, and Black African identity for a form of racial affinity and collectivism that is a practical and broadly political form of unity based on common conditions, interests, and political aspirations as Black, African, and African descendant people. It is a form of Black, African, and African diasporic uh, consciousness that is broadly decolonial in that it lends itself to a recognition of joint and overlapping social and international structural and systemic social political and intersectional conditions of black people across the world and the inherent need to transform these conditions into ones of dignity, freedom, equality, and not least justice. In this sense, not only does a social political conception of black African diasporas speak to their interconnected conditions, it also speaks directly to the need to understand, evaluate and address them politically. Yes, that's it, thank you. Hello, everybody. Give us just one second. And uh, we had a tech issue, but we've got it now. So Keith is back.
There we go. Thank you, Dr. McKeetrain, for that really wonderful um, keynote. And what a fascinating way just to kind of frame our conference and just so many of the, the considerations that we're thinking about as we talk about all Black lives really mattering. Um, I really appreciated the way you kind of laid out the different types of African um, diasporas, right, such as the old and the new, um, and certainly what it means to be kind of, you know, in a world where all of those diasporas are both implicated, but also in some ways, um, you know, rubbing up against, contesting each other. Um, I think it really kind of brings um, to light the questions we're trying to raise um, at the conference. So a, a couple of different questions, and also want to just also invite folks to populate the Q&A feature, right, with questions or comments if you have them. Um, you can also put them in the regular chat box, but if you put them in Q&A, we can see them a little, little better um, and work through the list a little more, a little more carefully. So I, I wanted to kind of pose a, a few different points. One was about language. And I think immediately as you began speaking, you, you kind of began kind of hedging your bets <laughs> um, by kind of saying how sometimes the language is, isn't effective. And as you went further into it, you talked about how we can use terms like, you know, like black and, and kind of talk about, you know, racial identity, but these terms may be more descriptive and definitely not essential. And so maybe you just say a bit more about the role that language plays as we try to, you know, kind of articulate um, African diasporas in Europe in more open dialogic ways, as, as you're suggesting. What role does language play in helping us to get to a place where we can think about blackness in, in these more complicated, but also more more reasonable ways? Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for that, uh, Keith. So, um, yes, la language of course is 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 critical and very important and um, when it comes to uh, black african diasporas as i call them in in europe um, language is highly contested and so uh, terms like like black um, are are contested terms among African descend, uh, descendant communities across across Europe, and especially it seems uh, among uh, first generation um, new African diaspora uh, residents, uh, and they often feel that uh, you know this uh, term black is 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 an imposition that they cannot um, an outside imposition that means very little to them if not nothing especially as a as as a um, term of of identification uh, and that they would be preferred to be referred to um, as you know their um, national in terms of their national regions the ethnic origins but also in terms of their um, continental origins as as africans uh, and then of course, there's a lot of conversation across Europe uh, among African descendant communities, how they should describe themselves. And this is also true in Sweden, where, uh, you know, um, some, you know, I've, I've met a lot of African descendant Swedes that are not comfortable with, with referring to themselves as, as black. And uh, some that would, you know, prefer maybe to refer themselves to themselves as Afro Swedes, as Africans, uh, as African Swedes, uh, you know. So yes, language is a a, a, a big issue uh, when describing uh, African diasporas in, in in Europe, and is much less settled, if you will, than what it seems to be in the US and many other parts of the African diaspora. Thank you for that. No, I, I really appreciate that response. So I have a couple kind of follow-up questions. I mean, so how does that complicate the situation you're outlining in, in, in Europe and, you know, kind of in terms of thinking about kind of Black Europeans? How does that complicate organization in terms of kind of getting people, you know, in a room together, right? <laughs> getting people to have a kind of conversation when the sense of kind of what we're fighting for 
is connected, but also so fractured, right? So how does that, mm -hmm. I know you've talked, you know, especially of late about Black Lives Matter, the global reach of mm -hmm. that, George Floyd, mm -hmm. et cetera, and how that's mm -hmm. you know, made possible, right? This mm -hmm. a genuine global movement, but at the mm -hmm. same time, the complications you're talking about makes it hard to mm -hmm. really, you know, organize and you know mm -hmm. do things in the UN and do things at mm -hmm. a certain level. So maybe mm -hmm. say a, a bit about that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that is, a, that is a huge challenge, but I think that has always been a challenge of Pan-Africanism, uh, you know, uh, the, the um, you know, how to, how to uh, unify, how to work together, how to uh, recognize and uh, acknowledge, uh, you know, commonalities and, um, and so forth and, and common interests and, and, and really uh, do some proper work, work together. Um, you know, that has always been a challenge and that, that continues to be a challenge. And, you know, I mean, that is a challenge that I think everywhere, but it's, it's, it's especially big of a challenge in Europe, uh, precisely for the reasons that I outlined that uh, uh, Black African diasporas in Europe are, um, are recently or are quite recent as a phenomena. Uh, you know, don't have long histories in their countries, have not developed any national black communities that can be described in as, as uh, you know, cultural group, ethnic groups, uh, uh, and so on with, with joint um, histories and, and so forth. And so, of course, this sort of um, heterogeneity, which is, you know, uh, quite a radical form of, of, of heterogeneity, you know, represents just black people from across the world happening to live in the same place and, you know, uh, say wanting to work together or uh, wanting to uh, uh, speak together as a collective. Uh, of course, this raises all sorts of challenges that those of us who do, do this sort of work um, um, are, are uh, dealing with, if you will, on, on, on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, but there's a lot of uh, opportunities uh, now uh, to, to do this sort of global work uh, now with, for instance, with the establishment of the UN Permanent Forum of People of African Descent, which the General Assembly decided to establish back in August last year, and which will be officially launched later this year, and that I have also been very involved in. Um, and then, yes, you mentioned the Black Lives Matters movement, the, the second wave of the Black Lives Matters movement uh, in 2020, which arguably was the, uh, saw the hugest, the most massive uh, protests, global protests in human history. I think that is fair to say, uh, did have also a bit of an impact and it did uh, here in Europe and, and it did uh, lead to some uh, policy actions at the European Union level. And it did, for instance, here in Sweden, lead to the formation of a, a new collective and organization called Black Lives Matter Sweden, of which I'm a board member. Um, and uh, unfortunately here in Sweden, as in I think most other European countries, however, the Black Lives Matters, the second wave of the Black Lives Matters movement did not translate into any concrete policies. Um, but yes, the struggle continues as they say. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So we, we have a question from um, the Q&A um, and, it, and it reads, what are your thoughts on Wilderson's, and this is Frank B. Wilderson's, Afro-pessimism? Um, would it also apply in the Afro-European context? And just to kind of add one more sentence about that, I mean, as you were speaking, what I actually wrote down was I recalled a line from um, Wilderson's book, where he's, one of his books, where he talks about having a um, culture of politics, um, but not necessarily a politics of culture, right? And, and I think I kind of heard resonance of, you know, of that as well as you were speaking, but um, what is your take on Afro-pessimism and do you find it useful as we think through um, the case of black Europeans? Okay, uh, thank you, yes. Um, yeah, uh, I, the, the, 
writing about Afro-pessimism is actually uh, 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 something I'll be doing later on this spring. Uh, and also writing about black identity making in, 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 in Europe uh, and within the social political framework. Um, now, you know, of course, I would agree with Afro pessimism that systemic anti black racism is a thing, is real and very uh, tied up with, with modernity, if you will. Um, but that is, I think, all I agree with. <laughs> I think I, I, uh, I, I don't want to start talking about Afro-pessimism actually, but uh, no, um, it's in many other ways, I think uh, a deeply unfortunate school of uh, thought uh, that uh, uh, leads to unhappy reductions of black subjectivity. And I think often also panders to white sensibilities and white affirmation, white recognition and such things in ways that I think are both misleading, misguided and unhealthy. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to push you further if, if you don't want to say um, too much more about that, but I certainly kind of understand your reservations around um, the way that it might totalize Blackness. I think it's something that I've thought about as well, you know, ways in which the Blackness of Afro-pessimism kind of, you know, goes all across the globe, but it kind of exists in the same kind of way. And I think what I'm hearing you saying definitely, you know, this morning, well, this afternoon for where you are, um, but also in your other work is that the blackness we're talking about is, is, is so much more complicated. And I think um, kind of honoring that is, is essential to your, to your work. I, I want to ask a question that you kind of touched on, um, but maybe you might want to say about, say a little bit more now. In, in what way is the kind of third wave of African diasporic thought that you're talking about also useful for revising the older African diasporas in, in, in the sense of this? I imagine that for younger folk or just folks living in 2022, right? Who are, let's say, you know, black Americans and we can use that in the most essential way that we can imagine, right? But they are also in some ways, right? Temporally removed from the Atlantic, from the Middle Passage. And so even though I, I agree that, you know, the work of Gilroy and others, of course, is essential, right? It's kind of thinking through like the indispensable, you know, the way in which the Atlantic and the Middle Passage is essential to our sense of blackness. In what ways are kind of the, the phenomenon you're discussing in Black Europe also useful for thinking about, you know, situations where Blackness feels a little more stable and, you know, self-evident? Maybe you might want to say this a little bit about that as well. Yeah, oh, th thank you. That is a great, great question. Uh, yes, I do. I do think that precisely because um, Black collectivism is not something to be taken for granted in Europe, whereas in many ways it can be taken for granted elsewhere, including in the US, and where African Americans can rightly so be described as an ethnic group with a joint cultural identity and history uh, in the US and so forth. Uh, yes, I think there is the risk, and we see this quite a lot of a sort of black complacency, perhaps, in the in in places like the U.S., which I think is much less likely to 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 happen uh, in in Europe, and where I think the sort of black consciousness that you do see in Europe. Um, is by its very nature, I think, more political, more international or internationalist. Um, and that this does have the potential of rekindling, reigniting, uh, you know, Pan-Africanism, for instance, if you will, in an international uh, sense. And uh, does also, you know, include the the domestic as well as the international dimensions of of systemic racism. 
for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, definitely agree to me. I think that. that oh yeah, did you have? Do you want to finish that comment? I don't want to cut you off. No, 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 mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I think that definitely from, you know, a U.S. kind of Black location, even though we were speaking before we officially began, I was born in Jamaica, um, but I have no Jamaican accent to show off. <laughs> um, but, but I've been in the U.S. for like 30 years. And so I feel both, you know, my Caribbean kind of, you know, um, origins, but also being in the U.S. And there's this sense that, you know, like our, like the U.S. Blackness is, is good, <laughs> you know, like we don't need any type of international framework. We don't need discussions of, you know, heterogeneity, you know, like we have like the, in some sense, like uh, lots of black folks in the US, like they have the real blackness and the other blacknesses are just kind of like imitations or, or copies. And so I think so much of what you're saying about, you know, this third wave and thinking about kind of blackness in a European context, I think it's really helpful because I think every, you know, person of African descent, however you want to kind of frame, frame that or imagine that needs to kind of understand this because it's so, it's, it's useful, it's helpful, but it's also real. This, this is the way that race is actually experienced in the modern world. So, so thank you mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree with that. I agree with all everything you said. Although I think the provincialism that one can see maybe all too often in 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 the U.S. Uh, is uh, 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 you know phenomena that maybe uh, all too many Americans in general uh, are afflicted by. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think that, right, right. So the American exceptionalism kind of, you know, overlaps with, with other types of a sexual exceptionalism as well. Um, and I was thinking about even in um, the book, um, you know, even in Sweden, right, it talks about kind of Swedish ex exceptionalism, right? So there's ways in which I guess so many places are trying to cut off themselves from global histories to, to, to make themselves unique. Um, we have about three minutes left. Um, so I just want to kind of give you the space to kind of maybe just offer some final thoughts on like future directions in terms of your own organizing work, scholarly endeavors, um, kind of what's next um, for Dr. Michael McKeetrain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you, Keith. Well, look, uh... Thank you. I, I especially uh, appreciate, you know, having conversations like these and and so on, because uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, here in Sweden, I I work very much in silo and and uh, don't uh, often get these sorts of opportunities to have these sorts of conversations. So I'm I'm very grateful for uh, for that and and all your questions and so on, uh, and your comments. Uh, and I was hoping to maybe hear from the audience also. But anyway, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what the work, the sort of work I'm, I'm doing uh, now, I'm uh, actually working on two books, uh, one that is going to be on both Black studies in Europe and with two sections, one on Black studies in Europe and one with key themes in um, the international decade for people of African descent and what I think should be or will be uh, key themes in this new UN permanent forum on people of African descent, including reparations. And right now I'm working on a very, uh, the most ambitious, not to say pretentious <laughs> piece I've ever worked on, which is uh, the working title is, um, uh, can universal human rights address colonial legacies in the global economy? Question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm also working on another book uh, called Sweden and the Others Decolonial per Perspectives, which is going to be an anthology. And last year was the 20th anniversary, if you so, if you will, of a book that I was the I co-edited together with Louis Fai. Uh, uh, Rosemary's brother actually <laughs> uh, called uh, is, uh, yes, the, 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 the literal translation of it into English from Swedish to English would be Sweden and the others, post-colonial perspectives. And it was the first book, or at least among the first books with post-colonial perspectives on Swedish society. So we are going to do a follow-up, if you will, uh, and hopefully it will be published next year. Um, or no, let me see, yes, maybe next year. Yes, 2023, right. So that is that that is what I'm working on. And then I'm doing, yes, a lot of activism also. Um, and so, you know, we've got quite a lot of things cooking um, 
as I mentioned, the UN Permanent Forum of People of African Descent is being set up. And so I'm involved in an international uh, civil society working group around the Permanent Forum. And we are um, working on a variety of things among them, uh, setting up together, hopefully together with the Office of the High Commissioner, setting up an international civil society network around the forum. And I hope that a part of this uh, civil society network, there's also going to be a special space for researchers. And I'm hoping that black studies researchers from across the world will engage in this forum and will uh, feed into this forum with research-based recommendations and studies and so forth and to work together with civil society and be, you know, uh, I, I, I can only wish that black studies uh, in general was maybe a little more socially engaged than it is these days, unfortunately. Well, we're so excited to hear about your upcoming work. Um, and of course, we'll be following that closely. Um, and you certainly are busy in terms of both your research and activism. So we appreciate your time um, this afternoon with us. Um, it's been an incredible hour. The time has actually gone by too quickly. Um, but once again, thank you for kicking off our conference. Thank you for your time, for your expertise. Um, and of course, we have upcoming panels um, starting quickly. So we want to just give people the opportunity to log off and enter those rooms as well. But once again, thank you, Dr. McKeetrain, for, um, for just a wonderful, um, wonderful keynote kickoff. Um, we are so appreciative. Um, and I think I speak for the room as they're sending their thank yous. I'm not sure if you can see all those thank yous and well dones popping up um, in the chat, but we are especially appreciative for you um, this afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Keith. And uh, and, and to everyone uh, on this uh, call, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot for, for this opportunity and uh, hope to see you all soon again or another time. All right, take Definitely. care, have a good one. Later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.